So let's get going with this webinar uh, where my intention is to explain to you guys uh, how Arbitrex aggregates the liquidity you use as a, as a trader or an investor with our, with our little exchange. And in the process, I'll have to cover a bit of ground beforehand to set a common theme. So uh, we'll cover how organized markets uh, work, the, the way that you know, the New York Stock Exchange or the CME organized uh, exchanges uh, create prices. Uh, you'll see that that is in stark contrast with the way prices are set in over-the-counter OTC markets, such as uh, retail forex. And then uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll walk you through how uh, broker works from the inside by discussing an, a little event we had uh, as recently as, as last week, which we have explained in our, in our blog, where uh, a large trade triggered a, a micro flash crash or a small scale, which hopefully helps you internalize all the theory here. Uh, I have set apart, uh, I have set aside uh, quite a bit of time at the end for Q&A, so I expect me to talk for say an, a half an hour or so, uh, and I'll be happy to stay on until you guys have no more questions uh, to do with either this webinar or anything else, uh, Darwin X, but I beg you, because I will not be answering um, any questions outside of the agenda until the end, otherwise the, the recording will not flow so nicely. Also, uh, I have uploaded a copy of this presentation as the handouts. You're free to download that at will or whenever it suits, so feel free. Uh, we will not charge you for, uh, for it. So, with that said, uh, before we get going, uh, we need to discuss a bit of terminology, and I'll I'll read through this table so you understand it. We're going to start uh, from the market creators, the liquidity providers, all the way down to the liquidity takers, which would be you in in this case as an individual customer of Darwin X. So, so who's a liquidity provider or a, a market maker? Well. In, in its strictest sense, uh, it's any market participant that routes limit orders to an order book uh, and thus creates market depth. And this is what's, what's called making the market. You're probably asking yourself, what is a limit order? Well, a limit order is an order specifying two parameters that can only be regarded in combination. That is the price at which we're willing to trade and how much volume we're willing to trade at that price. Because both can't be split from each other, a limit order can either be either hit fully or partially or not hit. But if it is hit, it will only be hit at its price. I, it cannot be slipped. There's no such thing as a true limit order entered into an order book, which gets uh, executed at anything other than the price that the liquidity provider had decided to enter into the order book. So what is the order book? The order book is a, sna a snapshot photograph of the queue of all the limit orders that are piling up on both sides of the, of the spread, on the bid and the ask at any given point in time. And then you can probably jump the queue to enter the order book by becoming a liquidity taker and sending a market order where you send an order for the best price in order to fill all of your volume. So your volume, your input is to hit the volume and the output is the price at which you filled, which will, will be slipped for better or worse. This, it's not like a limit order. It is one where the price is unknown because it's the output of the limit order of the market order you fed into the order book. And last but not least, uh, least, a liquidity taker is any market participant which chooses to jump ahead of other limit order providers, i.e. the liquidity providers, and go straight into the order book. And the way you pay for the, this privilege of jumping the queue is by uh, being agreeing to being slipped, positively or negatively, but you are going to be slipped uh, in most cases when you take a uh, market order. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, so we will be talking about liquidity providers and liquidity takers. And now and we'll be talking about those in two ways in which a market can be organized. One way is the first way that markets start. And typically it's a bilateral set of relationships between market participants. So one example of this is the world's institutional effects market, which in the beginning only really contained institutions in it. Institutions 
that were all integrated with each other. So let's say this is UBS and UBS already had credit lines and used to trade with, say, Goldman Sachs here, Morgan Stanley there, and uh, whatever, and uh, BBVA, a Spanish bank over here. And also BBVA has relationships with each of the other. So you have a network of crossed relationships, which is a function of the number of pairwise relationships between all the participants. Now, as I explained today, this thing is practical to get going, but it gets to a point where it has a number of drawbacks which can be overcome by creating an organized exchange on the right with a central counterparty, which plays a role a bit like a referee by being in the middle of all participants and centralizing all flows across all of them. So on the left-hand side, we have what you called an over-the-counter market. On the right-hand side, we have what you call an sorry, I clicked the wrong button here, an organized market or uh, the way you would see it from an exchange, okay? So we're now going to start by explaining how the price is created by the participants we've got in here by looking at the right-hand side example here in an organized exchange, okay? So I will be asking you some questions in order to force you guys to think so that you hopefully internalize this and this takes more than just a theoretical exercise. So this is a sample snapshot of the order book for the mini S&P 500 uh, futures contract. I just grabbed this off the internet. I have no idea when this was taken, but it was a good enough image. So first question for you guys. How do you create this order book? Come on, I want to see the brave guys who had jokes beforehand provide some insights in here. Go for it. I will not call out any names, but I do think it's it's best if you guys think how this order book comes about. Okay, I guess a, a shy bunch today. So how do you do this? Well, you basically take the uh, on the demand side, you take all the limit orders and aggregate them by price in in this case descending order on the demand side so as you can see the price drops this is what people are willing to pay for the stuff and this is these are all the limit orders with a volume at each level of price and similarly on the on the side of the of the supply you see the how supply goes up the more uh, the more the price goes up okay so what we've got here is just the limit orders by all the participants in the exchange who have chosen to enter the order book as liquidity providers or market makers? That's the first question. So that I, I've given away the second answer. So the order types that this displays is the limit orders by all the market participants. And this is a key one. So who's providing the liquidity in this case? So who's creating the, the liquidity in the market right now? It's a pretty obvious question, you would think, but that doesn't hold up in FX. You're... Okay, so uh, we've got Schultz saying the orders in the market already, yes, but this is provided by all market participants. So crucially, in an exchange, everybody can create liquidity by entering a limit order into the order book, okay? This is unlike the, the case for FX, believe it or not. And of course, the answer, just the checking question, how do you jump the queue? Well, you jump the queue by entering a market order and getting filled uh, by uh, essentially wiping the market depth, okay? So that's how an organized exchange works. Now, what are the key benefits of an exchange? I'll just summarize here. So the first one is it's centralized. So everyone's flow, be that the limit orders that you see or the market orders that hit the limit orders are centralized in a single matching book so that you don't have parallel, parallel universes where liquidity gets fragmented. Secondly, it's meritocratic, which means it's democratic in the sense that everyone can enter it and all compete to make and take the liquidity, hopefully for a profit. But no one is restricted to just being a taker or just being a maker. Third, 
it's anonymous. The central counterparty, let's, let's go back here, the guy's in the middle. This guy is in the middle of all trades, so party B could be trading against party D, but they wouldn't know because we've got this wall in the middle of the central counterparty that protects the identity and therefore the intellectual property of all participants for, for the benefit of all participants. Okay. Fourth, and most importantly, the every tick, every movement in the market order book is traceable. It, it leaves as a, 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 a sequence of steps behind. So anybody can check why a certain price was hit because anybody can see the log of the movements in the order book and the price is simply the output of the order matching process. There's no such thing as discussing whether a price was hit or not. There is a definitive answer, just like you would have if you know basically introduced video advertising on football games. So there's no arguing about what went on because everybody can trace what went on. And last but not least, it is robust in the sense that the center counterparty nets the risk for all the participants and can be capitalized as such. We'll, we'll come back to that in a second, but I'll give you an example here. So what happens if, say, A, which owes something to D, defaults? Well, it could be that because A defaulted, then D also defaults because it doesn't get what it is owed. And because D owes something to C, then also C defaults because D owes it something that it didn't uh, that it that it didn't uh, that it defaulted on. Sorry, I clicked too much here. Apologies for that. I've got a very sensitive mouse today. Uh, and it could be that then B defaults on A, and that's the reason why the whole thing defaulted. So no one is really defaulted here. It's just that we ha we, because we have a, a chain reaction, it all sort of spirals out of control in a way that it cannot be the case here because the central counterparty nets the exposure but everybody. Okay? So I had to provide this theory because FX does not work this way. Okay, this is uh, uh, the, the, there's Nicola. Nicola is also suggesting that there's the option. Uh, the, there's no option of last look. We will discuss that uh, as well. So basically, whatever you see on the order book is real liquidity that you can hit, and there's no such thing as a liquidity provider entering a limit order in the order book and then refusing to fill it once it's hit, because he will then be expelled from the exchange from for essentially taking the piss from other participants. OK, so over the counter aggregation. So what do you have here? Well, this is the order book by one of our prime brokers uh, at some point earlier yesterday, which is when I prepared the, the snapshot. OK, so what you've got here is optically the same thing. You've got volumes in descending order and, and descending price and ascending price uh, with with a different uh, uh, volume available at every depth. And then what we've got on the right-hand side is the volume weighted average price, which results from weighting the cumulative uh, amounts available at each, each level of market depth and creating a, a, a market um, a spread for every amount traded. So uh, if you trade at the top of book, the spread is 0 0.2. If you send a 10 million uh, ticket to the order book, then you can expect to be slipped by 0 0.2 uh, in relation to the top of book. Now, Importantly, there's a question here. How is this market depth constructed? Well, it looks the same as for the uh, exchange order book, but it is different. So the way this is set up is that you have, say, three liquidity providers streaming prices, not limit orders and uh, an orientative volume that they're willing to do at each level of price. And then we have a piece of software that some people call an electronic communications network or an ECN that synthesizes the information from the three different sources into a single order book so that you get an idea of what you could get by sending all the volume to the best of the providers at, on either side, side of the spread. Okay, it's a completely different way of going uh, of um, resulting in the price, one which is I think inferior. So, 
Another question is, who feeds this new order book? Think about it. Is it the same as before or, or not? Actually, it isn't the same as before because only super participants in an OTC market have the right to create liquidity. So it's only the so-called liquidity providers who provide orientations of at which price that they're willing to, uh, to trade. But you, as an end user, as an independent customer, do not have the choice to enter a limit order into that order book. So you're a kind of second class participant in an OTC market. So three, come on guys, I want answers here. So where does MT4 show you the market depth? So uh, there's a, a Valiant here who said, at my broker. So unfortunately, Schult, if you look back at the presentation here, and, and thank you so much for, for participating. Don't take this the wrong way. So on MT4, you only see one price. You, you see a bid and an ask. But here you see three pairs of price because you're seeing the market depth. MT4 is a platform designed for dealing and you, no, you don't see the market depth, as Robot is saying. So that's exactly right. So you do not see the market depth on MT4 because MT4 is a platform designed for dealing and the dealers do not stream market depth. They either trade or they don't, in which case you get a requote. Okay. So um, we'll discuss later and I need you to understand what the top of book means. So top of book is the uppermost layer, TOB, of the market depth, the one where the least volume is, but also the one where the closest distance there is between bid and ask, where the narrowest spread is. And that's what most brokers choose to show because if you're trading at retail volumes, you still get typically get filled at the top of book. But if you trade at larger volumes, then you wouldn't and you would get slipped because you're moving the market. The market is not infinitely liquid. Okay. So with that in mind, Let me summarize the differences between an organized market and an over-the-counter market like the one you trade uh, in, in FX. Well, the first one is, and this is key, so how many markets are there in the futures market? Well, there's only one because there's only one order book where everybody goes trade futures, and that is, say, in the US, the, the, the CME, right, or the CBOT, right? That's, there's only one order book. Whereas in an over-the-counter setup, you have as many order books as you have combinations of different liquidity providers. And also because a, and a, and one liquidity provider can feed different prices into different customers, you can have potentially as many markets as you have customers, as you have price takers. There's no such thing as a single market. And this creates things like adverse selection. So in, in FX, what, what happens to us, for instance, is because we are a broker that sends all the flow to the market, that we, we are continuously asked to essentially segment our flow between what providers call toxic flow and what they go, uh, call benign flow. Benign flow is flow that's typically easily hedged, perhaps because it's customers who lose. And in that case, they're quite willing to give us a choice spread where the, the, the difference between the bid and the ask is essentially nothing. Whereas if you happen to be a scalper that aggressively goes for uh, misalignments in the prices of different brokers, then they require that, that we stream broader prices to you, something like you know, 0 0.3 uh, spread in the, in the euro dollar in order to protect themselves against the opportunity of arbitrage that they are creating when they stream at 0, .0 uh, spread. Okay, so I've touched upon how many order books there are. Then in an organized market, anyone can provide liquidity. In an over-the-counter market, just the designated liquidity providers can, not you. Because in an organized market, the only way for somebody to hit your stop is to wipe all the market depth above you. In an over-the-counter setup, they can trigger your stop individually with by streaming a, a price to you that's different from the price that they stream to all other parties, which is not good, if you ask me. 
And last but not least, the whole point about how robust this is, you probably don't think about this one all that much because you haven't really had to think about counterparty risk. But from our standpoint as a broker, counterparty risk, the possibility of placing customers' money, your money, with a prime broker that may not be there when we go fetch the money back is a real issue. So we, you know, we'd much rather trade with an exchange than we trade with individual liquidity providers. But unfortunately, the way the market is organized right now is over-the-counter only in FX. So I've provided a lot of theory up to now. So I now want you to play with me a mental game where I'll ask you to be the operations manager of, uh, or the risk manager of Darwin X. So uh, just as in a Lego set, you get a whole bunch of pieces and you're asked to put them together. I will give you a set of pieces right now and we'll play putting them together to run a broker as we go through the presentation. So. What do you need to run an ebook only broker like Darwin X? Well, first, uh, first of all, you need liquidity providers who are willing to trade against you. And it's them who have to approve you, not vice versa. Okay, so you have to, they knock at the door of Goldman Sachs, UBS, and uh, all, the, all the big guys, and they have to accept trading with you, which it just essentially means. Yeah, they're asking you, will you be there if your positions go pear-shaped? Uh, I, will I be able to collect my PNL from you? Yes or no. And if they have any doubt, they will not trade with you because this is all about trust. Second, you'll need uh, uh, to host your servers in uh, uh, very closely to where the LPs host their servers. In the case of Darwin X, we do this in uh, uh, London LD4. Third, you need uh, an aggregation software to build a synthetic order book out of the prices that your LPs are streaming to you. In this case, we use PrimeXM software called Xcore. Four, you need margin, you need cash that you will have to put down which each, with each of the LP relationships that you want to maintain. Uh, more on that later. And last but not least, you will need uh, quite a bit of know-how because if you don't know what you're doing, you can end up in a mess pretty quickly. And uh, hopefully, I'll show you now how that works. So let's. Here's the challenge, okay, guys. You guys now want to aggregate liquidity from different providers. Uh, three liquidity providers. I'm saying three for the sake of argument because this doesn't change if there's 15 of them. Uh, you have got three liquidity providers who are willing to price into you. You've got the software in, hosted in the right places. You've got the right software. You're already creating an optimized synthetic order book by combining the snapshot from L LP1 with the snapshot from LP2 and LP3 in real time. And you've got access to the order book. And boom, you send your first euro dollar open leg. So you try to open a trade in the euro dollar and you hit liquidity provider one. Okay, so I've basically sent a trade from MT4 and I've uh, and LP1 provided the best price on say the bid and I got filled. And now it's been a couple of hours and I want to close my trade, my euro dollar trade, and I send my closing order. And this time it happens to hit a liquid provider two. So I've got myself in a position where what is my risk right now? Think about it, guys. The more you think about it, the more you put into it, the more you will get out of it. What happens now? I've opened the trade with LP1, so I'm long LP, uh, long euro dollar with LP1, and I'm short euro dollar with LP2. Between both, I'm flat, and yes, I've, spa I've paid the spread between the LPs, but there's something else. The fact is, I've got open exposure and market close, rollover is approaching. So what happens? Well, unless I manage to somehow net the exposures between both sides, on average, I'm flat because I'm, you know, the, I've got I'm minus euro dollar on one and plus euro dollar on another. But I ha the fact is I'm minus in one place and plus in the other. And I'm going to, play, to pay swap to both liquidity providers. So I'm going to get hammered by the financing charges. And I've got a choice. I can either choose to pay the spread back in order to unwind both positions and pay commission twice to get out of this, which is a way to die quickly. Or I can choose to procrastinate and leave my problem up until tomorrow, in which case I will die slowly by paying swaps. But the fact is, yes, I managed to get a slightly better spread by aggregating between LP1, 2, and 3 when I first opened this. But I'm now in an issue, which is I'm paying swap. 
or I'm forced to pay commission to get out of this. Or, worst case, depending on how the PL goes for both trades, I will have to post additional margin to both sides, even though in theory I'm actually flat against the market. Okay, so I've managed to get myself into a bit of a mess by trying to be too, uh, be too clever by half. Okay, so that's what DarwinX does all day. Now, of course, the, the, the benefit that DarwinX has is that we have uh, several thousand customers now. So we have guys who are going long and short all the time. And, uh, and we, we've got the possibility of, of uh, unmatching all of this. But for that, we need a, a, th a third party here, which is called a prime broker. On that, a, a, bit, a bit later. Now, for now, let's just look at the de decreasing returns I get to adding more liquidity providers. So the more liquidity providers I have, the more I have to spread my capital across all liquidity providers. And I will have as much margin as I have on the least comfortable LP. So if there's, uh, for whatever reason, I've got a position with an LP which happened to go particularly pear-shaped, I will have to post additional margin, which I cannot withdraw from the others unless I want to continue being able to aggregate. As I do so, we will have cross exposure. So it will be long one leg with one LP and short this, uh, the opposite of that leg with another LP, but the whole thing will not net out. So I will have to pay costs for either hedging I'll be paying the swaps and I will, I'll have to incur in a lot of counterparty risk because my money is spread across 15 guys. Does this make sense, guys? Hopefully I'm not losing you. Okay. So here's where an invention comes along and that invention is called a prime broker. So rather than you or us for that matter, because Darwin X is pretty much you in this case, instead of Darwin X posting money with LP1, LP2, LP3, what we've got is a prime broker. In this case, in, in our case, we have uh, LMAX, which is not a prime broker, it's actually an exchange. So LMAX, is, LMAX works the same way as what I showed you before, an organized market. And then we also have a last look liquidity uh, prime broker called uh, Saxo Bank that you probably know that provides credit services in this case. So rather than us having to post money to LP1, LP2, and LP3, what we do is post money with our prime broker, and our prime broker then post their money with LP1, 2, and 3, so that we can enjoy the benefits of aggregating without having to go through the hassle that I just described to you before in terms of managing all this. Okay, that's what a prime broker does. A prime broker is somebody to, who gives you, who lends you margin so that you can aggregate liquidity as if you had posted collateral with, with LP1, 2, and 3 without actually having to fund those accounts up front to avoid the problems that I mentioned before. Okay, hope that makes sense. So, uh, and then this is the setup we've got just now, as I, as I mentioned. So we have on the one hand, a proper exchange environment with LMAX, where there's an order book with a rule book and uh, binding limit orders without last look. So this is how we think things should be, where everybody is trading on the very same spread, on the very same price without any possibility of discrimination because it's fully anonymous. And then on the left-hand side, because it's sometimes possible to get better spreads on a last look basis, provided you have a benign enough customer base that loses enough to entice the LPs to price more tightly into you, then we have a relationship with Saxo that does this whole prime brokerage game for us. So we have the way we think it should be and the way it is with everyone else, uh, with one of the best prime brokers we can think of in terms of technology and solvency. Because of course, your money is partially posted with Barclays in London, but also it's partially posted with LMAX and Saxo Bank. So the last we want as Darwin X is that Saxo Bank goes down with our money and your money with them. Okay. So any questions so far? Anything that shocked you, anything which was unclear uh, that we can discuss now? Because we're not going to go into an even more applied example, but uh, I still want to make sure that you guys understand how it all works from behind. Okay, so it looks like you, you guys are very, very clever folks because you're not asking any questions. So let's go for the next one. So 
I'm not going to explain to you something which visually can be presented as a snowball effect. So a little thing starts at the top of the mountain, it starts gathering speed and, and snow, and at, by the end of it, you've got a huge ball that can take pretty much anything down with it. Okay. So what happened on last Tuesday? So Tuesday, the 19th of uh, September at Darwin X, three seconds before the market close at uh, five, you know, 4.59.57 New York time. So what we had was but towards the end of the session, most of the liquidity providers, which we have uh, anonymized here. So note that if you are a Darwin X customer and you know with which liquidity provider you trade, we now have the uh, execution quality section where you will know the exact names of who provided what leg at what time. But we have been asked by our liquidity provider not to disclose their names in a public webinar because we are we fear that somebody watches a recording at the YouTube and then draws the wrong conclusion, something like, you know, UBS are assholes because this and that and the other, which would be misguided. So we have them here as anonymous. They are banks whose names you would know. Now, three seconds before the close, the banks are not posting additional market depth into the order book. And what happened is we had a giant market order in relation to the market depth that was available at that point. An order so large that it basically swept the entire market depth available at that point and created a spike of about 100 basis points. Now, because the price, the, this order triggered a huge spike, then all the resting orders with uh, stop losses on our MT4 were triggered, which of course compounded the dearth of liquidity, which of course compounded the spike, such that it got to a point where a lot of people who never expected to be hit with a 100 pip spike, even at market close, got hit, and it created a major mess, okay? Now, this was on cable, but as you can see, there was a co corresponding widening of the spread at that very same point in time, because which was triggered precisely because the algos at the LPs priced accordingly as if this had been a genuine market move, okay? So Schultz asked a very clever question, which was, if you're dealing with a prime broker, don't you get the best price automatically? And the answer is yes. We do get the best price automatically because we are big enough to be able to send enough flow for them to accept us as customers. So yes, one of the benefits of trading through DarwinX with a prime broker is that you are getting the best price automatically. Yes. But you're getting the best price that's available within the market depth uh, made available to the customers of DarwinX and DarwinX only. So you don't really know. It's only an indirect mechanism whereby uh, to, for, to avoid arbitrage, whereby what happens at the DarwinX mini market feeds back into the IG or Pepperstone or Tickmill, whatever alternative mini markets. The fact is we're talking about lots of different markets instead of just one. They're all linked because you could arbitrage if the price drifts too much but they are not one market. I hope that made sense. Okay, so you're not talking, when people talk about the FX market, well, it's a, it's, it's a verbal convention to talk like that, but the fact is there is no such thing as one FX market. There's thousands of FX markets. They all exist in parallel, which means they, none of them can drift too far apart for fear that people could arbitrage between them but they're not directly linked with each other. And that has the consequences that we've discussed between the different differences between over-the-counter and, um, and uh, organized exchanges. So the question, my question to you guys is, whose fault was the snowball? Was it the customers? Was it the liquidity providers? Was it the prime broker? Or was it Darwin X? So who's to blame when there was this big spike? So Schultz is blaming Yellen, and I. So so do I. So Selvaraya says customers. Okay, that's a clever point, Selvaraya. The customers. Which customers? There's a hundred customers in here. Each of these dots is a customer. Which of the customers is to blame? So Robert is saying the LP. I have to warn you, it was a catchy question because none of the guys listed was the correct answer. 
So Selvalaya, you have a, a good point there. I mean, arguably, the first customer who sent a huge order three seconds before the market close, he was to blame or he deserved to be slipped because that was a market order and that's what happens with market orders. So that first customer was to blame. But how about the customer whose stop was triggered as a result of the first fuck up? So the first guy who's a bit down, further down the line in the, in the snowball, is that guy to blame? I don't think so. So Robbie, he did bang on the nail. Thank you so much, Robbie. I mean, I'm, I'm very happy because you know when you when you give all these webinars, one feels like very lonely and feels like talking to a wall. If you ask me, the person to blame here is none of the market participants. The person to blame here is actually the system itself. So if we go back to the the thing here, is it's the left hand side system that is to blame. If the system was set up properly, then it would have been far more robust. I am not saying that flash crisis cannot exist in organized markets. They can, but because all the liquidity is in a single order book, there's a lot more friction. There's a lot more safeguards before that snowball starts gathering steam. And that's basically the one thing I wanted to bring across today, and that is that over-the-counter Forex, at some point, will hopefully have to migrate on exchange or remain a Mickey Mouse market, which will eventually not attract uh, traders. For our part, we want to create an FX, uh, well, an asset class out of traders who trade amongst others FX. So we very much want uh, uh, the regulators to clean this up. But until they don't, we will be forced to continue having the proper solution, which is an, an exchange alongside a slightly improper solution, which is the best of a flawed system, which is what we've got with Saxo. And we can't do this alone. So whenever the FCA provides uh, regulation on how to change all this, uh, we would be providing our opinion. And if you agree with it, we'd very much like you guys to provide feedback on that. But that's, the, uh, in a nutshell, uh, what I wanted to cover today. I hope it was useful. So if uh, anybody has questions here so selvaraya is bringing a, a good point across which is the customer who sends very large orders is there a way to prevent such action or should this be normal and allowed well in normal circumstances i think this should be normal and allowed because that's what a market is about if you want to send a very big order you should know that you're going to get very big slippage but uh in a in a system where all the liquidity is in a single order book, that slippage is roughly within bounds. When it comes to a market which is a kind of micro market like ours or pretty much every other retail brokers, I agree with you. One potential safeguard we might want to introduce is to have maximum size orders configured. The problem is that the software is awfully difficult to configure. We could configure one maximum size order, but we have to tailor the maximum size to the liquidity available in the market. So if the customer had sent this not three seconds before market close, but say uh, midday, then the order wouldn't have been a, pro a problem at all. But if he does send it three seconds before the market close, it is awfully tough to configure MT4 to have time sensitive maximum sized orders. So it's, a, it's quite an operational headache to implement the solution. I agree with you, it's, it's the right approach, but it's, it's not practical enough for us to, to go about it. So it's a very good point, but it's difficult to implement in practice. Are there any other questions? Or do you guys have any suggestions on stuff that was unclear today that you'd like to you know, be taught about in future webinars? We always welcome those because that's, you know, if you guys have that question, chances are everybody else has them and they haven't thought about it long enough. Um, so, Selvaraya, the, I, I'm not in a position to give you the order, but uh, what I can tell you is uh, at liquid order times, that order would have been filled with about one pip of slippage, and instead it triggered a 100 pip spike. So it was big, but it wasn't anything that was earth shattering. I mean, I guess the one corollary from this is that, you know, 
if you really want to stay away from trouble, do not send large orders at end of at uh, close to market end, and do not go into close to market end with uh, tight stops and take profits because they might get hit and then it's a mess. Okay, so it looks like we're running out of questions. Uh, I just wanted to thank you guys for uh, your, your interest in showing up at, at this webinar. The, the session will be recorded, and as I mentioned before, the handout with the, the slides is uh, available for download here, and you will also receive it with, uh, with a reminder email that you get automatically. So I hope if there's any questions there, feel free to reach out to us at info at darwinx.com. And also, uh, we have a blog post on this subject in, in, the, in the blog. If you want to ask any questions there, you can also do that there. So thank you so much, guys. Thank you uh, to those who have participated. I really appreciate it. And thank you also to those who have stayed on to the end. It's, it's always a pleasure. Take care and happy trading. Bye-bye.